Good afternoon. We are in the Brittany Healthcare Center in Natick, Massachusetts. It's June 8th, 1999, and our guest today is George Labossiere. George, would you be kind enough to spell your last name for us? Capital L, small a, capital B, O S S I E R E. Thank you. You're welcome. This program today is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Program. George, where do you live? Do you live in this building? Uh, right here in Brittany. You live in Brittany? Yeah. Um, are you married? I was. You was? And you're a widower now, is that it? Yeah, well, I'm not a widow. I'm a, I'm a divorcee. Okay. Fifty years we separated. Fifty years ago? Yeah. Do you mind if I ask you your age? I'm 84. 84 years old? Yep. And I understand you're going to have a birthday in August? Yep. That will be 85? Yep. And 15 years from there will be 100? Oh, no, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any children, George? No, no. No children? I'm one nephew in California. Okay. He's a judge. Do you see him any time? Well, the last time I saw him, I buried my brother over there. That's the last time. Quite a while back then. Yeah. 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 Where were you born, George? Where? In where? Yeah. W-A-R-E. Where, Massachusetts? Yeah. And were you raised there? Yeah. Family there? Uh, Mom and Dad came there or were there when you were born? They were there when I was born. Yep. Did you have brothers and sisters? I did. I had uh, one crippled brother who was handicapped. My other brother joined the Navy. He, he retired from the Navy. My sister. Are they, uh, are they living now? Uh, no. They're all gone too? Yeah. Yeah, what was your family background? What, what was uh, your dad and mom doing and where? They come from a working family. Yeah. What did, your, what did your father do? Well, my father did everything. Uh, he, he worked in any job he could get. Mm -hmm. My mother worked in the laundry in summertime. My brother, the cripple, hang, worked 50 years in a woolen factory. Woolen factory? Yeah. Where woolen. My brother joined the Navy. Uh, When the hell did he join? I know it was before me anyway. Before you? Yeah. And I think you joined in 38? 39. 39? Yeah. He was already in. So he, he went back, way back in peacetime then, before, oh, yeah. before the war. Yeah. Uh, how did you arrive in Natick, George? How the hell did I arrive in did you move here to live here? I bought a house here. Over at Weathersville. Martin Sorrell sold them. You know where the bowling alleys are? Over sure, there? you're behind, behind that. that. Yeah. Sure, I know where that is. Of course, it's uh, north of Route 9. Yeah. I bought one of the first houses over there. When, uh, when did you enter the military? 1939. 1939. Did, did you do it from Natick? Yeah, I went to Springfield. You joined in Springfield, Massachusetts? Yeah, you go to Springfield. Yeah. Why did you join the Navy? Well, I had been working in a restaurant. And one day, I, I had to, uh, tried to jump a fence and sprain my ankle. So it was why I up right. I said, what are you trying to do? Look for sympathy. I said, no, I ain't looking for sympathy. Goodbye. I picked up my jacket, went home. My mother said, now what? I said, I'm going to the Navy. All right. So that was it. How old were you then, George? My so math is not 24. good. 24. 
You were 24 years old. Yeah. And there was a war on in Europe. Yeah. That had begun in 38. Yeah. And did you feel perhaps uh, the United States would become involved? Well, uh, the first year I was in the Navy, I thought something was cooking. But we didn't make preparations like we always did. Um, Where did you go uh, for your basic training? Newport, Rhode Island. Newport? Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Do you remember that back in 1939, what it was like? Sure. Uh, you went down, you raised your hand, you got your plate of beans, and then your suit, lived in the barracks, and you drilled, you know. And then we were sent, packed up and we were sent to uh, Norfolk, Virginia to go aboard the Wyoming, the old battleship Wyoming. And that was in Norfolk, Virginia. And when I went aboard the Wyoming, I strung my hammock out. That's when we had hammocks. And I got in my hammock and I got seasick, tied up to the dark. <laughs> Believe it or not. And from there, I went to the USS Texas. And we used to work out of Newport. Uh, <clears throat> that was when the old North Atlantic Patrol was in. And that's when the Germans were in raging hell up there, you know? Mm -hmm. Sinking ships. What kind of training did you get at uh, Newport and then Norfolk? What did they train you to do in the Navy? Manual of arms. They didn't train you for any job. You just trained, you know, back and forth, like a uh, hot two, three, four, and back again, back again. <laughs> and uh, then we went, up, uh, we were assigned to uh, Texas. Uh, let's see. We were assigned to divisions. No particular, we had no particular choice in it. They just took our name and said, you go here, you go there. Mm -hmm. And I was in the third division. Did anyone from Natick, uh, any of your friends or family go into the Navy with you? No. You were just strictly alone by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, after a while, what particular duties did you have aboard the Wyoming and then the Texas? And the Texas was also a, a battleship yeah. of the same class? Yeah, well, a little bit better. A little bigger, wasn't it, and newer? Uh, um, no, you went to work in the division, and they used you as a, a deckhand, you know? Mm -hmm. And from that, they watched you work, and they, then the petty officers made their decision who they wanted to work for. They picked you out. You didn't pick anybody. And, uh, something like and then I wound up working in a turret, which I wanted to do anyway. So uh, the turret was interesting, you know, two battle two guns. What's, what was the size of the guns on the turret? Twelve. Twelve-inch turret? Yeah. Twelve-inch guns? Twelve-inch guns. And what was your job in the turret? I was first loader on the gun. You were the loader? First loader. Okay. Can you tell us what that means? Well, it's really, you know, you work on a powder train coming up from the bottom. Mm -hmm. And when they get up to the gun room, uh, there would be two guys underneath the platform that would pass the, uh, two out uh, of the four bags of powder to us. I was one of them, and another guy. I had one side, he had the other. How much did these bags of powder weigh? Uh, about 1,200 pounds. And then you loaded the guns? Oh, yeah. And did you actually take part in firing them? Sure. I was right behind it. Can you tell us what's it like to be inside a turret when those things are fired? No noise. No noise? No. No. 
and we just go shh. And I, you know, I was uh, on this job. I had we had to stand up against the the wall, the wall of the book, and I thought, and I gonna go shh. That was the recoil of the gun. Yeah. And then I had to dump, jump out down the platform and wait for them to open up the the plug, which was a a one-ton piece of metal. Mm -hmm. And um, my job was to look in the, the barrel and watch the smoke go out, you know? And then when it was, if it was here, it's uh, all clear. That meant load again. What did you like about being in a turret? Oh, I see. Well, there wasn't much I dislike. It was pretty good. Pretty good job to have. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it. Uh, yeah. Okay. We used to load. We used to load a gun in twelve seconds. During this time, were you still at Newport and Norfolk? No, I loved the North Atlantic. You're out in the North Atlantic now. Yeah. But you trained to do this at at Norfolk largely, didn't you? No. No? We trained on the ship. Okay. Now what were what were you doing out on the North Atlantic? Looking for Germans. So this was this after nineteen forty one then? Before. Before. Uh, the, you remember the Bismarck, the German battleship? Yes sir, I do. That sunk the hood? Yes, with one shot. Yeah, well, two. But they hit the same spot. Uh, so we, yeah, we went out looking for the, uh, for the bridge, like, and the captain said he was going to look for it. And the crew was saying, you're crazy. <laughs> <coughs> there was no possible way we could uh, beat that thing. That was waterproof as hell. And, um, so we never found it. I mean, they never found us. We were lucky. Was the United States at war with Germany at this time? No, 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 no. Can I ask um, why you were out looking for a German battleship? They were a part of the, what they call the, the Atlantic Submarine Force. And they were chasing the British. But we were out there to help. And uh, that was it. Was this somewhere south of Greenland? Yeah, sure. That's where you were? Yeah. Did you ever find the Bismarck? No. And no, we you, never found it. Did you ever, well, let's see. How should I ask this? Did you ever? After the United States got into war, uh, were you then still doing the same thing? Well, when we got into war, the Texas was uh, Portland, Maine was our home base. We would alternate with another ship taking turns out going out there. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, on this Sunday, we were in Portland, Maine, and I was sleeping uh, on the deck. And um, when that thing come down, boy, we start tearing the ship apart and getting ready to go. What thing came down? When, you know, when the noise came down about the, we're going to war because... You heard about Pearl Harbor? Is that... Yeah. It? Yeah. So that was December of 1941 and you yeah. were in Portland, Maine. Yeah. And you realized that you were now in a state of, well, the next day, we're in a state of war with Germany. Well, frankly, I was so damn patriotic and nothing bothered me. I wasn't scared a bit, you know. <coughs> and my brother was over at Pearl Harbor when he got hit. Was he injured or hurt? No, 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 no. And what kind of ship was he on? He was on a destroyer at the time. At Pearl Harbor. 
How did you two guys get to tell each other that you were all right? I guess we were the letters we wrote to my, uh, my mother. Yeah. Yeah. So she was kind of home base for both of you. And sort of, yeah. Yeah. All right, you're uh, December 7th, 1941. You're on a battleship in Portland, Maine. What yeah. happened then? Well, went back to the ship, and the crew was called back. And the way we took it, we went off somewhere. I forget where. They never told us where we were going. But were your duties such that you felt you were still looking for Germans, either submarines or, or capital ships? Oh, hell yeah, sure, yeah. Were you with other ships? Later on. Yeah, do you remember which ones they were? No, I, don't, I wouldn't. Uh, they were all different types. Were they all American or were they British and others? All American. Yeah. Did, uh, you, did you have air cover? No. You were pretty much by yourselves out there. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Did you go to Europe, that is, sail into any uh, British ports? Uh, after, 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 what happened in Maine, then, then we went down and we picked up, um, we had to take all of the linoleum off of the decks, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we went into Portsmouth and loaded up with stores and off we went. But we never knew where we were going. Tell us about take, clearing the decks for to go into battle. W were they covered with aluminum, you said? L uh, linoleum. Linoleum. Did you ever hear of the battleship linoleum? I mean, the, the material, which was, was highly got by polish, you know, and mm -hmm. stuff. They scraped that up and threw it over the side. They didn't bother where it was going. It just went. Um, was it? That's because it was not fireproof. Yeah. And so, where did you go to do that? That was done no matter where you were. Yeah. Some in Portland, some in Norfolk, and and then the, and. We had to spend the time rearranging the, the ammunition, the, the, the shells, you know, and stuff. And then they started drilling the guys for, for the gun crews. And I mean, they, they drilled and drilled and... You were an old-timer in the Navy by this time because... But 1941, they had to get a lot of new people to come aboard and learn your jobs and things like that. What did you do? Me? The same job? I stayed with the same group. I was in you the did? same turret. Okay. And, uh, the, um, I see. Yeah, from there. And then I went where I was back in Iceland again. And I was transferred back to the States. We came back on a, a, a tanker, no, no help at all, all by ourselves. You got aboard the tanker up somewhere around Iceland? Yeah. Or the Greenland Straits or something like that? Somewhere, in there. And we were heading home. On a tanker? Yeah, oil did, tanker too. What did you do on the tanker? Sleep. You were just a passenger. Yeah. That was good duty, George. <laughs> I scared the hell out of you. Because you didn't know if you were going to go swimming or not. Yeah. Where did, you, where did the tanker come into? Newport. Did you feel that as, as the war progressed and you were, uh, had gone in in 39, did the Navy prepare you well for your job and what you had to do? Well, it's not being a member of the gun crew, yeah, but yeah. Uh, when you talk about preparations, there's no preparations made, say, in 1940. You know, you're just a, a ship and you're out there 
uh, keeping the Bismarck Company and stuff. Nothing much happened no, uh, no, till no. after 1941, is that it? No, no, nothing, not much. How did you find out or hear when you were on board a ship? What was going on in the rest of the Navy? Where the ships were? The radio. Were, the radio. Yeah. That was your chief source of uh, yeah. information? Did you have anything like a newspaper called Stars and Stripes or something like that? Well, I, I ran into it a couple of times, but yeah. it never gave us much information. Yeah, there a lot of guys, you know, that would go ashore and talk. <coughs> then you have a lot of guys who go ashore and they try to push their chest out a little further and stuff. Oh yeah, they're all the same. Nobody was different. No. no. Take us take us through what you did now, George. You c you came back to the states. Did you go back on a battleship? No, no. Where did you go then? I went to uh, destroyers, and then I went to uh, aircraft carriers. Can you name any of the destroyers you were on? Well, let's see. I, the only one I remember, and uh, this destroyer group, there was four of us. And we, one day I was home on a weekend, I got a phone call to come back to the ship because we were leaving. So I drove down in a hurry. To Norfolk? No. Newport? Newport. Yeah. And uh, there was four ships on there, all taking men on and stores. And they said we were going to the Mediterranean for um, three months. Well, three months came and it went. We had Gibraltar. And when we got there, somebody sent a message. Good luck on your new adventures. So the four ships are saying, where the hell are we going? <laughs> you know? So we went from Gibraltar, or, or if I, I'm going to miss a place. Well, we wound up at um, Port Said at the beginning of the Suez Canal. So you went the whole length of the Mediterranean Sea? I went around the world. Yeah. What What was your duties on board the um, the destroyer? I was in charge of my gun group. So now you're in charge of a gun group? Yeah. Inside a turret or no. out, outside? Outside. Were outside. these five inches? Yeah. And did, were you in combat? Were you meeting uh, submarines or other ships? You know, somebody asked me that before. Every time we pick up a sun, we go chase it, and then they get away from us. And we, uh, one of the sub chases I was on, we picked up an echo one day, and we started to chase it. And we chased it and chased it. I, a day and a night, and then we were waiting for a ship to come down to relieve us. And the son of a gun came down. He was 60 miles short of where we were. So anyway, uh, I, uh, from the Suez, we went to Suez, to, uh, through the Suez Canal. We stopped in Saya Salon to get some uh, oil. And every place we went into, the American printed, uh, English printed newspaper used to say, go home, you were Americans, you were on the war. So we didn't think Tell, tell us again, what did the newspapers say? Told us to go home. The, the station in the Ceylon we were supposed to spend eight, uh, four were you, hours. Were you at Colombo? I guess so, I don't know. Uh, we were supposed to fuel in eight, four hours. They gave us the smallest hose they had and then doubled the time of loading. They didn't like us at all over there. 
can do you can you tell us why George or why did you feel that was so not the way I felt the way I was treated yeah why did they treat you badly I don't know I really don't know but I know that's the way they were in, while you were in the Mediterranean, before you left Said and went through the canal, uh, were you you were chasing submarines there? Well, no. Yeah, in a way, and yes and no. Because we had, when I had so many different duties, we didn't know where the hell we were going to go. Did you ever run into the Italian Navy? No, no, I never did. Did you have anything to do with uh, the battles that were taking across the, uh, taking place on North Africa? No. Never went into battle. All I did, all I did was, we were sort of a supply ship, and we, we used to tell the Marines, "Shut up, we'll get you there, we'll take you back." That was our favorite model. Uh, we. Uh, so you, you're you're pretty much now in the Indian Ocean. Oh yeah, I always remember. way down there, down the uh, around Cape of Good Good Hope. And then we came up, and that's when we started heading for uh, um, Formosa. And this was say in the fifties. This is all one journey that you, uh... You mean uh, the one that started in Norfolk? Yeah. The four ships? Yeah. Yeah. This is the same journey. That's incredible. It's a we huge the, distance. We were the first and only American squadron to go from Newport, where we assembled, and come back after a year and go back to Newport. The only squadron to do that first. You sailed around the world. Yep. And, and you we were, were told you were we going to go. We were always together. <laughs> You'll be told you were going to be gone three months. I told my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> I always get shot when I got home. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, and then we get the promoter, and we got assigned to the four of us. or assigned to the job of patrolling the Formosa Straits. Between, between mainland China and the island. Yeah. yeah, but listen to this one. It was three points of land. One, one ship was here, the other one was here, and you, you go up and down, you know? And we used to alternate. And you know what they told us our job was? And the Japanese started, uh, they started to come over, the Chinamen opened fire, asked no questions. Can you imagine four little ships like that trying to fight the, uh, the Chinese? No, I can't. What did you think about that? You were in great danger there. Oh, <laughs> not what I thought of it. All what the rest of us thought of it. They said, this guy must be crazy. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah. And then we had to pick up some Chinamen one day to escape them from North, North Korea. We picked up about 20-some uh, of them. I mean, they were uh, adrift. They had been sunk? Yeah. And we, we kept 20 of them aboard, and then we transferred about maybe eight of them, eight or ten of them, to the carriers for amputation. And we had them assigned, we had eight, 20 guys in a little compartment, you know. And they were really a pain in the neck sometimes. Because if you gave one a cigarette, the other 19 had to get one. If one got something, the other 19 got it. And so. Were you with attached to a, a carrier group, George? When I was on a carrier, yeah. Yeah. What can you tell us? What carrier that was? 
O zaman niye değilim? O zaman niye... Yani değilim o zaman. O zaman. Were these S Essex class carriers or larger? Bigger. I was on the first carrier that put an angle deck on it, you know? Not yes. A, not the angle deck used to go this way. Yeah. And they could land. Which, do you remember the name of that carrier? That was the Antietam. It was? Yeah. What were your duties on board a carrier? Well, I, I had charge of the magazines. I had a group of men. I walked around cleaning magazines up, you know. What was your rating at that time? Chief Petty Officer. So you're now a Chief Petty Officer? Yeah. I never changed. I was getting in trouble. <laughs> uh, pretty good life, though. That, you, huh? That's a long time at sea. Did you get to go ashore in some places? You spoke about Ceylon. Um, and maybe did you go ashore at Port Said or places like that? No, they wouldn't let us go. They wouldn't let us go inside Port Said. How about any other places do you remember being there? Mostly in uh, Italy, France, stuff like that. And then uh, we made one trip right up to the Adriatic Sea in the Trieste when the Americans' body was dumped in the ocean. We went up uh, for that, and that, that was that was that was a slimy job, because you know what the natives used to do over there? They would take piano wire and string it across the front of their jeeps, or we met the Americans would run in and do it and cut the men's heads off. You know, and they, they were mean. Was that at Trieste or yeah, Trieste. parts of Italy or uh, Trieste? What what uh, can you tell us on the calendar about when that was? Was that 44, 43? I'm trying to remember now. I mean. Uh, <coughs> I'll be damned if I can tell you. But well, I know it was uh, saying uh, at the beginning of the, the fall of the, of the year. Yeah, it's uh, somewhere in here. Uh, did the war end? Had the war ended? Because you were in the service right through 59. So <coughs> well. Can you remember where you were when you heard the Germans gave up and then the Japanese? Well, this is going to knock you over. But, uh, I was in a place down in Virginia, going to school. And this other chief and I went to the chief's uh, bar room and we had a drink and that's when we heard about it. We had two dry line sailors, we never get there. You heard that the war in Europe was over? Oh, yeah. There wasn't much celebrating on that, though. How about uh, when Japan surrendered on the Missouri? Where was I? Uh, I was on a ship somewhere. I don't know where. How did you feel when you knew the war was over? Well... You get a funny feeling. You often wonder, how the hell did I live so long? Uh, uh, <clears throat> There's no running around and jumping. No. You've uh, done so much, George, or you up to this time, and we're only halfway through your Navy career. Uh, were there times when you were in direct confrontation with the enemy? Enemy ships, uh, submarines, or what? Or, or Mostly air the Germans. And, and can you tell one or two of those instances? 
We'd say, well, you got to sit pull my hand. German crews were well-built men. Oh, they were well-built. And then I was in South Carolina as the ammunition depot. And we had a group of German soldiers. They were members of uh, Romel's Corps. Boy, were they well conditioned. And I had, I had a master sergeant that was in there. He turned out to be my aide. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand that. Th these Germans uh, came to be with you in the Navy? Yeah, they were all at this camp. I, they were prisoners of war. I see. And I was in Charleston, South Carolina. Is that Charleston? South Carolina. Yeah. Boy, those guys were well built. Oh, they were built. You should have seen the submarine men. Arrogant, though. They were arrogant as hell. So the war was over, and you're meeting some of the people you had uh, fought against? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as this master sergeant, German master sergeant, he used to say to us, we'd be sitting down somewhere, he said, you know something? He says, if you crazy Americans had stayed home, we'd have killed the shit out of them. <laughs> Just like that. This is, I guess, we're up past 1945, 46. Oh, yeah. And now, what was your career like in the... Uh, Korea had not yet started. Uh, what was your career like in the Navy d in that brief piece? I went time? on uh, recruiting duty. You did? Yeah. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, a very interesting job. Uh, you met a lot of people. I had 21 towns to cover around here. It was here in Massachusetts? Yeah, and I worked out of Framingham. And you wore all your uniform with all your stripes and uh, I didn't ribbons have that many and stripes, stars. No. <laughs> I, I didn't get that many honors. It's, uh, Did you feel that uh, a lot of the people you had known had gone home and that uh, you decided to ship over? Uh, did you feel in any sense alone or no, lonely? No, no, no. Not at all. Because at, at that time, I was approaching about, oh, maybe 10 years or something at the end. Yeah. And I had decided to write in and then ship over and stay in. And my brother, of course, was a big influence on my staying in. The one who had been at Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Yeah. So you were in the recruiting business, uh, say, between wars, before Korea came? Uh, no, after. After? Yeah. At, well, when Korea came along, uh, how did that affect what you were doing? Oh, well, we had to be very careful because a lot of men were coming to us to try to re-enlist to avoid being drafted, you know, in the Army. Yes. And we couldn't touch them. We always had to call the draft board and clear the guy, make sure he, he could go. And how long did you, were you in the recruiting end? Two years. Two years, and then what did you do? Well, I thought I could stay in Framingham six months, and they wouldn't let me stay, so I had to go back to uh, Newport, Rhode Island, uh, Virginia. I had to go down south and get aboard a carrier. And there I stayed for six months. And I thought the ruling was that if you had a period of six months or less, you could stay in the uh, station, you know, mm -hmm. where your time was up. The state is never let me out. I don't know why. So is this about 1959? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you had six months to go, and you were on a carrier. Do you remember which one it was? I'm 
thinking. I, you got me thinking now. Uh, I can't think of it again. Okay. If you think of it later, let us know. Is this, uh, your time was up in the United States Navy after 20 years? Yeah, 19, 19 years, 6 months, and 10 days. What did you do then, George? <laughs> wow. What was it like to leave the Navy after 20 years? Oh, a lot of freedom. I went to work for Perini Company on a dredging boat, on dredging outfit. Mm -hmm. I almost got my fanny knocked off on that one. <laughs> and then I, let's see. I went to work in bar room. Did you ever look back at your Navy career and think about it? And yeah, you, you, I, I can I can look back and say, this is where I made a mistake. <coughs> Could you tell us about that? Well, my damn mistake was not staying in. Where were you discharged? New York. New York City. Flushing on Long, Long Island. Yeah. How important to you now Looking back, was your serving in the military of the United States of America for 20 years? What are your feelings about that? I really took it mostly as a job. I mean, when the war came along, it changed a little bit, not much. I didn't let it go to my damn head. I didn't let it go. I wasn't gonna run around and say I'm a hero, you know. No. How did it affect your, the rest of your life? Did you uh, feel if you hadn't been in the Navy, things would have been different? I would have been dead. I guess, I don't know. For some of the escapades I was involved in, <laughs> it's a wonder I'm here. I, uh, I, I don't, um, it was 20 years well spent, really. There isn't a place that you could go and work like that and make that kind of money, and the money then was pretty good. You had a lot of overseas pay, didn't you? Not too much. Sea pay? You get sea pay, but... Yeah. Uh, no. It, it's a, it's a deal where you were aboard a ship, you had a place to sleep, you had a place to eat, you do a little bit of work, and you had a little bit of money to spend, and you could go ashore. And uh, <coughs> some of the places I've been to, I, could, I would have never seen as a civilian. Tell us about just one of those. What, what stands out in your mind as, as a place that you have seen? I think the greatest thrill I ever got was uh, I ran into the Council General down in uh, Brazil. The local paper had a picture of him and his family, and his, his wife was a neighbor of mine back home in where. So I went to his office and called on him to tell him, you know, so he invited me out to the house for dinner and stuff like really? that. I had a great time. Uh, you do meet some damn interesting people, I'll tell you one thing. And if you say you never did, then you, you're, you're telling a fib. Because uh, you have to admit to something. You served through a World War One, and no. you served through uh, excuse well, me World well, War Two, yeah. and then then you served through the Korean conflict. Yeah, but you got out before Vietnam. Did did you feel you were well received when you returned as a civilian and people knew you had been in the Navy? No. no. 
They wouldn't do. They didn't. Didn't do me any honors. I didn't. I, I didn't look for them. I just wanted to be left alone. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, I know guys. I know guys that are, they went ashore and with their chest popped out and everything else. And I said I was here and I was there. Well, see, I always believed in, in this one in one thing about it. You were damn lucky to live through it. Damn lucky. And I had a friend of mine who was a Marine. He was a Marine sergeant. We were at the battle and chosen another reservoir. That was in Korea off of uh, and I was I was bombarding the beach. So the next time we had a meeting. He said, oh, you're the stinky guy throwing shells at me. I said, I didn't know you were there. And stuff. And, uh, some, same, some people seem to think that the world those you were living, if you were, if you were involved in such stuff. And, you know, you're only doing what you think is right by being in the armed forces. I don't. I don't suppose. I know it's so bad. Guys die and everything else. They can't be helped. But they die at home. They get hit by automobiles and stuff. And uh, And I think the only time I really got mad when I first got out, I went up to the post office on Washington Street and I was going to try to apply for a job. And I went upstairs to the post office department and I was on. Um, this is sort of racial, you know, but you were colored. So I was waiting at the counter. And, uh, she said, what can I do for you? I said, I'm trying to get a job with the post office. And then it started. Are you a veteran? And nothing makes me worse than that. I said, if I was a veteran, I wouldn't be here. She said, how many points you got? I said, I don't know. You tell me. And you know what? I only had five, four or five points. I couldn't get it. I couldn't uh, sign up for the post office. Now you figure that one out. And 20 years of it was combat duty. So I missed out there. Who cares? I mean, I saw I made, uh, made money. I got good jobs even, even though I left there. I then I. <clears throat> I put a, 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 a claim in for a job in Cambridge, and I was living in Boston. That's where my resident was. I filled out an application, and you know what they did? They sent it back and said I didn't qualify because I didn't live in Cambridge. I said, well, I settled that. Sometimes, uh, huh? Sometimes there's a great unfairness, isn't there? George, can you, as we finish here, can you think of back over 20 years or even more than that of people are going to look at this tape a long time in the future, maybe 50 years away. Is there something you'd like to tell them about your time in the military service of the United States? It was well spent, mm -hmm. for one thing. I, uh, <clears throat> by not waiting to be drafted, I could have saved my life. But you got to be thankful for so many things. I mean, I've been in places where men in uniform may come and say, I'm a Navy man, I'm a Marine, or I'm something else. And I would say, well, who the hell cares? You know, you're lucky if you're living. You could be all shot up. 
with everything else. So, um, I, I, it's really a puzzling thing. And even today, it's very hard to get good men in the service. Very hard. And the way that the way they're recruiting today, the Air Force is going to get get them all. And now the National Guard is starting out their program. Uh, you do two years, you get called, you get uh, sent to college and everything else. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I don't believe in that because that's giving them a, a, an education, but they really don't appreciate it. George, we thank you uh, very much for participating in this program today. It's very valuable what you've given us and, and what well, I don't think I told you too much. Oh, I don't think so. Thank you. We appreciate it. Well, thanks for the chance, chance to, to tell my story. <laughs>